<clears throat> okay, here we go. Uh, just wanted to start off by saying that uh, our dear colleague in Title II, Ryan, uh, has returned. There he is on the screen. He'll be chatting later to everyone here, but very exciting that they, him and his wife, Megan, um, had a, a new baby girl, um, and her name is Rory Lynn. And Ryan, do you want to say maybe when, what day she was born and how things were going? December 5th, so right at the beginning of the month, a nice, lovely early Christmas present. Uh, of course, we lost power for a week, so that was a fun adventure with the new baby, but otherwise everything's going great. So, thank you. Um, and then in other sort of big personnel news, uh, I think some of you saw the message that went out in Grants for Me, as well as on the newsletter for folks that read that religiously, um, that our uh, Cheryl Ling, our ESCA Federal Programs Director, retired on January 5th. So Friday was her last day. Um, she expressed, obviously, that it had been a privilege and an honor to serve. Um, and we, uh, the folks on this call, are going to do our best to continue to provide the assistance and support um, in her absence as we um, have that job opening at some point will be posted. Um, and at some point, there will be a replacement for her. Anyone have questions about that? Or we could talk more about that if anyone's concerned or wants to reach out to her. I don't know if we got her personal email or, or whatnot, but. Okay, so this is the fun part. Um, <clears throat> Title I, just wanted to uh, convey to folks that uh, it's that time of year, if you are a targeted assistance program and you're realizing that maybe you want to reach more students, um, you wanna have more flexibility with the teachers that work with Title I students, um, you'd like to run some kind of additional programming, and targeted um, Title I programming just doesn't allow that flexibility. Uh, you're, you're a district uh, slash principals of schools may desire to turn a targeted program to a school-wide program for Title I. Um, there are sort of guidelines. Um, there's a whole school-wide plan that has to happen because the biggest sort of um, center um, peak for Title I school-wide, really the whole point of it is to marry it to your high needs. So documenting that high needs with data analysis, understanding your teachers and your students where they are and which subgroups of students you're hoping to still target under a school-wide program, you're, or I should say, um, really still keep them as the focus. So it is a lengthy process, but I think it's a very, um, I think it can be a very effective one. I think it can be, uh, an incredibly powerful switch to from targeted to school-wide. So I am more than happy to help districts across the state who are considering school-wide, happy to answer questions, happy to provide guidance. Um, this is definitely a passion of mine to move targeted programs to school-wide. Um, for those under 40% of poverty, there's just an additional waiver to express why um, you still want to move to school-wide, even if you're under that automatic 40% threshold. So. Um, I do have a guidance document, if someone can throw that in the chat, um, that does have the entire sort of how to plan, how to apply, um, and sort of what you can do under a school-wide program. So just wanted to make that plug, and then always submissions are due July 1st. So I know that's seven months away, but usually this process can take months because it requires a diverse group of stakeholders to talk about what a school-wide program would look like and what needs it would meet. And then we have comparability coming up. We're gonna work with our data team and we're gonna get automated reports for districts who have schools that are similar in size and maybe are non-Title I versus Title I or different Title I schools. Um, it's under ESEA statute for those that love to check um, that, fiscal, or that uh, law. And so uh, we will be letting folks know kind of in the next couple months, uh, probably before February break, if there's anything with comparability. So just wanted to put this on the radar. We ran, we ran a similar process last year. Most, most folks, most districts meet comparability. And for those that don't, we help them plan what that can look like. I think Monique. 
Good morning. Uh, this is in regards to the fall assessment and accountability school identifications. Um, last May, the SAUs were notified of identifications of schools in the district per our accountability model um, as required by the US DOE. Um, we identified for ATSI or tier one, TSI, tier two, or CSI, which we call tier three, utilizing 21-22 assessment data. Um, the notifications also indicated that another round of identifications would be conducted in late fall um, using 22-23 data, assessment data. Uh, we are continuing to work closely with the US DOE in approving an amendment to the Maine's model school support plan ensuring that our accountability model school identification provides additional supports where needed and most, most and meets all statutory requirements. We are still working with them and we, we uh, will let you know um, when we have a date or when that information becomes available. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. Um, Ryan. All right. So uh, those districts that were involved with monitoring for our fall window should have received some notification by now that the results of any corrective actions have been put into the instrument. Um, as you can kind of see in this picture, you'll see your initial score for that item. And then if you had to submit documentation, if it was approved, there should be a yes. If for some reason it wasn't approved, you'd see uh, a next action step or a comment would have been sent to you directly saying what specifically needs to be done to meet requirements for that monitoring item. So those are there. Uh, we did have a few SAUs who have not been responsive with the monitoring instrument. And so we do wanna let folks know that uh, if those SAUs remain unresponsive, we are going to pause reimbursement of ESEA funds until they complete the required uh, actions for the monitoring instrument. I suspect most of the folks on this call, if not all the folks on this call, are probably not in that boat. Um, if you're here at the office hours, you're probably also making sure you're just in communication with the regional program manager and submitting your required items. But just wanted to let everyone know that that is our next step if folks are not doing the things that statutorily we have to make sure they're doing. All right. <laughs> So uh, our winter window is now open. It was opened a little bit earlier this week. That was a few days later, I should say last week, a few days later than we had intended. So we are extending sort of the, uh, the window that it's open for folks to turn information in through January 19th. Gives you actually a little bit over two weeks to make sure you have everything you need. They just brought As up. So I'm asking Jessica's Jessica's. As a reminder, if you're uh, identified as needing a medium level of support, you're just doing the medium items. If you have a high level of need, you have to do both the medium and the high items. Monitoring resources are on our website, including all of the fact sheets now. We were short a couple uh, just before this morning, but now we have fact sheets for every item up on the website. All right. And lastly, right, as we're using those fact sheets, just a reminder that not every item is going to apply to every SAU. So for example, uh, none of our folks who receive Title I-D are in the high monitoring category. So we have two 1D items that are in the high category. Those pages are automatically turned off, right? Because your LEA, if you're in high, does not receive 1D. And then some others, we do have to use the fact sheets and sort of work through. So for example, we have two items that apply to Title I and Title III. And the way they're worded, you might immediately say, I don't receive Title III. That doesn't apply, but we have to kind of dig in a little bit deeper. So for example, with item B8, it deals with parent and guardian notification of multilingual learner status. And if you check out that fact sheet, it specifically talks about if you're using Title 1A funds to serve multilingual learners with language instruction like you would under Title 3. So if you are doing that, even if you don't receive Title 3, that item would apply to your district. But if we're not using Title I-A funds to provide language instruction to multilingual learners like you would under Title III, that would be a not applicable. Item B9 similarly applies to both Title III and Title I, um, but it talks about if you're serving multilingual learners under Title I-A and making sure that you're communicating with parents and gathering their feedback uh, in a method that is effective. And so when we're talking about multilingual learners, that would mean in a way that they can understand. So we would want to see some sort of documentation on 
using the language that the parents have. And I think we have some more specific details that are in that fact sheet that Rita worked on and got up on our website today. Thanks. And Ryan, one thing I'll just say too is so many of the Title I items, including these Title I, Title III items, are parent notifications this time around. Um, and some of you may see that you notify parents in your handbooks or your um, or you combine one notification that is sort of two or three. It has testing and teacher. So look through everything, kind of understand and know that some of you guys might have one document that uh, achieves two of the items. So again, your communication with regional program manager, your understanding of the items before you start to um, put them in uh, may be helpful to, um, to kind of clarify. Travis. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, going to kind of continue on here with this um, Title III train here. So um, just some a bit of new information to share with folks, something to be cognizant of as um, you're kind of thinking through things this year and maybe looking forward to uh, mm -hmm. next year's ESE application. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have a new option for folks who are interested in applying for Title III funds as part of a consortia. Uh, now, you may be asking yourself uh, why uh, you would want to do that. Um, essentially, what the new consortia option for Title III is going to allow folks to do is if you're in an SAU where, you know, maybe you have 30, 40, 50 uh, multilingual learners, uh, which in and of itself wouldn't qualify you for a Title III allocation, um, if you have a, a partnering school district or a, a neighboring school district or two um, that might have, you know, a similar um, subgroup of multilingual learners, uh, you guys could essentially partner together uh, to have more in that like 90 to 100 student range, uh, which would um, bump you into Title III eligibility um, as a minimum receiver. I think the amount's around $10,000 or so. Um, but that is something new that's going to be coming up with the 25 application. Uh, and in preparation for that, uh, there will be a, a bit of paperwork or a form or two that um, the department would need you and your partnering district to complete. Um, Dan will be sending more information out on that in the coming weeks. But um, just be mindful that uh, the tentative timeline for that is to, to hopefully have a clear sense of who wants to be uh, part of a Title III consortium um, by uh, early April this year. So again, something to be thinking about, um, something that you'll likely need to um, bring to your school board um, if it's something that you're interested in, but maybe, you know, think about having some of those conversations with some of your, um, you know, neighboring school districts if you're kind of on that cusp of Title III eligibility. Um, and then also wanted to share something Title III related that we learned from our recent U.S. Department of Ed um, audit uh, having to do with supplement, not supplant. Um, and so really the big takeaway here is that um, Title III funds cannot be used for uh, teacher endorsements or certifications that are otherwise uh, mandatory or required by law. And so... Uh, basically, the big takeaway here is that if your district has historically or might currently uh, be leveraging Title III funds for ESOL certifications, endorsements, what have you, um, those types of things are are not um, appropriate based on what we learned from, again, our USDOE audit. So if, if you fall into that situation, uh, definitely uh, reach out to your regional program manager. Um, and we can kind of talk through how best to address that. And then lastly, with regard to the um, Immigrant Children and Youth Program, um, this is kind of a uh, more of a smaller program. I think, in fact, there's only one SAU each year in the state of Maine that receives this award. Um, but that award is currently slated to go out by the middle of this month. Um, the selected uh, SAU will be notified via email by um, our Title III coordinator, Dan Weeks. Um, and essentially what that's going to mean is that um, your the SAU in the state of Maine that has had the most significant increase um, in the number of immigrant students um, over the last year or so. Uh, and essentially you're going to get an allocation of funds to support those students. Um, which will also inherently mean uh, an update to your FY uh, 
uh, 24 ESE application. So again, just something to be mindful of. Dan will reach out as he has that information finalized. Um, and you'll also see an update to your uh, ESE application with a new um, immigrant children and youth uh, allocation of funds. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, I want to let you know that we are resuming our federal fiscal office hours. Um, the next meeting is going to be held January 25th at 10 a.m. You can register for uh, the meeting um, using the Sorry. Main, Sorry. main DOE professional development calendar. Now, this fis federal fiscal office hours are for um, business managers, bookkeepers, school administrators, anybody that has anything to do with federal funds. It is a time that you can ask questions and we can give you answers. They will be representatives from all federal programs at that office hour from the DOE. Next slide. So invoice backup documentation. Um, as you know, it is required for a detailed trial balance to be uploaded with every invoice that you submit in Grants for Me. Um, additional backup for travel reimbursement is needs to include the data travel, the reason for travel. Um, if I just see travel on the detailed trial balance under under the travel. Um, object code, it just says the name of the person and gives me an amount. I need to know what conference that was or the dates of travel, et cetera. So travel reimburse, any travel reimbursements will require additional backup. And please do not include backup documents that do not pertain to the request. So what I'm saying there is, um, if you're requesting $3,000 for, let's say, FY23 Title I, I shouldn't see 90 pages that have zeros on them. Just submit the pages that have the information so that we can align, I can align it to the reimbursement request. Next. Um, grant period of performance. So when you are considering using a grant to pay for a contractual agreement, keep in mind it the um, it needs to be obligated, which means signed, and all work completed within the period of performance for the grant. So if you obligate the money, sign the agreement thinking that you can use old funds or I should say draw down older funds before they expire. That is not the case. The work has to be done within the period of performance as well for the same grant. So during budget season, business managers, please communicate with your ESEA coordinators to decide which grant is available to cover budgeted costs. This is just uh, for your information. These are um, grants that are open right now under ESEA and um, school improvement. It gives you the period of performance so that it will be helpful for you to know when you are budgeting for the next grant year. Um, Non-public. Schools reimbursement for equitable services. The biggest thing to remember here is you cannot pay the non-public entity directly for any allowable expenses. And I do have a link there to additional information that would be helpful for both ESEA coordinators and business managers. Next. If someone can drop that in the... Uh, chat. That would be great. I know there's some buzz happening there right now. No. 
splitting invoices. This has been a challenge as recently. Um, so when you are splitting invoices between two grant years, you need to make sure that the expenses of, are allocable in both grant years so that you put it in the application. The expenses in both, like say FY23 and FY24 application, um, they must fall within the period of performance for both grant years. This gets really, really touchy when you're splitting like say a July to um, September invoice, right? So just be, be sure that it does fall within the period of performance of both. And both trial balances, the FY23, the FY24, if that's how you're splitting it, need to be noted. They It needs to say on there how you are splitting the expenses. And make sure that salaries and benefits are split proportionately. Now, this doesn't have to be exact. But I should not see salaries on one invoice that you're splitting um, and benefits on the other grant year. So just be sure that you um, include both on each invoice. Um, the only time it is acceptable to submit an invoice for benefits only, only benefits, is if it is um, tuition reimbursement that is paid directly to the employee as a benefit of employment. And I just want to remind you that uh, avoid submitting invoices for salary and benefits separately. Best practice, I think I pretty much went over this before, but if you're splitting expenses, it should be for the same billing period or service period. Um, so you would put, let's just use um, July 1st to um, September 30th on both the FY23 and FY24 grants, and then notate how you are splitting those invoices. Splitting invoices should happen only uh, to draw down all available funds from the oldest grant. I'm seeing a lot of split invoices where you're just taking a little bit from your old grant, FY23 say, and then you're taking this more from FY24, even though there's still money available in FY23. So I wouldn't recommend doing that um, because when it comes to closeout, that's when you get in trouble and you, you're scrambling to draw down the grants that are being closed out. Next. That was it. Besides our contact information, I can share that again for folks. That's also on our website. I do need to, now that I say that, I need to remove Cheryl, um, <laughs> update the website. Uh, but yeah, these are uh, the folks on the call besides Dan. And I just took out some of the slides that we do about just the professional sure. learning calendar because it was up earlier and, uh, and just our turnaround to make sure you go to your regional program manager and give them enough time to respond before reaching out to more folks on the team. So I just wanted to give, uh, now I'm gonna stop sharing and make sure that we sort of answer the questions that we have today. And I will also stop recording. <laughs>